with this being the last episode of season one, I figure this is as good a time as any to tell you about me. I was born into a Christian family. I was raised as what I term Baptocostal, part Baptist, part Pentecostal. And my parents divorced when I was four, and I would spend one weekend with my dad in the Church of God, the Pentecostal side, and the other weekend with my mom's family in the Baptist church. Now, I don't know how much you know about Christianity and the different Protestant denominations, but if you know anything about them at all, you'll know that putting Baptist and Pentecostal together is kind of an oxymoron because they don't believe very much the same on anything other than that Jesus is God kind of thing. But if you're not familiar and don't know that, just rest assured when I say that Pentecostalism and Baptists are very diametrically opposed um, as far as you can get in Christian denominations. So that's the kind of environment that I grew up in. Very strict Christianity on both sides, but in different ways from each other. One weekend with one, the next weekend with the other. And I grew up with what is known as the Protestant work ethic. Work, labor, hard work, constantly doing was praised and was drilled into me that if I wanted anything out of life, that I would have to work for it, that nothing is handed to you, that you have to work for what you have. And I grew up not expecting handouts of any kind and believing that accepting charity was a show of laziness and not people helping one another. And that formed my basic worldview when I was a child. Now, above all else, I was raised to believe that Christianity meant believing in the tenets of the church without question. And if I had questions, I learned very early on not to ask the questions that I had. It was more important to have faith and believe than it was to understand. Knowing or understanding was not necessary. All that was necessary to was to believe what was taught. Now, if you know me, and some of you do, some of you don't, but if you know me, then you know this. And if you don't know me, then I'm telling you this. I have always struggled with being a people pleaser. And I think part of that stems from my parents' divorce. It doesn't really matter what caused the people-pleasing nature, but I have always struggled to live an authentic life because the authentic me doesn't always lead to approval. So whether that was asking questions, which I learned not to do, or anything else, I have hid myself and tried to live based on what makes other people happy for so long. And that included blind allegiance to my religion of birth, Christianity. I did have questions, but I didn't ask them because asking questions meant that I was bad or didn't have faith or didn't believe. And for a long time in my life, I was fine with this. It was what I knew and I wanted to be a good girl, a good person, and I wanted people to like me and approve of me. So I was fine with hiding myself and not asking questions and pretending like I didn't have them. And I pushed aside my doubts and questions about religion and a lot of other things too. And I refused to think for myself and insisted that I believed what I was taught. Now, that didn't just go through childhood, that went through a lot of my adulthood as well. And in May 2011, when I was 31 years old, my life changed. I came home from work one day and found that my husband at the time had passed away. Now, I was 31, he was 24. 
And that changed my life forever. People say that, and usually it's a cliche, but it really did change my life forever. I can't say that I began to have little doubts about my faith because I had had them for as long as I can remember, but I started to acknowledge that I had these doubts. And I began to ask myself questions. And it wasn't long after that that I decided I didn't, or that I, yeah, I didn't want to continue to pretend that everything was okay. And I really did want to ask these questions. Now, the the way I grew up in Christianity, and I'm not saying that Christianity is bad or that all of Christianity is like this, but the branches of Christianity that I grew up in did not welcome the questions that I wanted to ask. So I began looking elsewhere. And I had always felt a special connection to Judaism. And I know now why I had that connection. But at the time, as a teenager, when it first, when I first became aware of this connection that I had with Judaism, this fascination, this longing to know more, I didn't know where that came from or why I had it. And I certainly didn't know in my um, early adulthood years where that came from. But I've had this special connection to Judaism, and that's where I turned to. I began reading everything that I could about Judaism and gravitating more and more toward it as a culture and a religion. Now, it wasn't a linear path. Obviously, most things aren't. But in 2016, I completed my conversion to Judaism when I sat before the Beit Din and entered the mikvah. Now, part of the process of conversion was choosing my Jewish name. Now, a lot of women who convert choose names like Devorah or Ruth, and those are good Hebrew names for women, especially women who convert, and I see why and understand why those names are chosen. But those names did not speak to me. So I chose my name by looking to my life. One thing that resonated with me was life itself and my focus on life. And I finally felt that by converting to Judaism, I was living at least a small part of an authentic version of my life. And also looking at my life after my husband passed away, I was still living. So I chose the name Haya for life. But I was torn between that name and moon. Now, I have always loved the moon. Its feminine energy speaks to me, and the moon has a special significance for Jewish women. So I chose to take a second name along with Haya, and that name is Levana, which means moon. So my Jewish name, Haya Levana, quite literally means living moon. And yes, that's where my business name came from. When it was time for me to choose a name for my business, I thought, what better way to show that there really is no distinction between me and my business than having my business have the same name that I have. So that's where my business name, Living Moon Meditation, came from. Now, it's been several years since my conversion. And Judaism has been a fitting addition and change to my life. And I love it. It is literally the best thing I've ever done was converting to Judaism. This life path speaks to me. This people group is where I find the most meaning in my life. And I haven't been static in my spiritual journey. Judaism hasn't been and I get there destination and now I've arrived and that's it. I just bask in its glory kind of thing. That's not me. So I've not been static in that. Judaism encourages questions and I still have plenty of questions. And I love that Judaism encourages me to ask those questions. But I don't practice my Judaism in a traditional way 
that a lot of Jewish people do. Now, I blend many different religions into my personal practice. Now, I do take, obviously, Judaism and its many components, but by converting, I did not leave behind my heritage of my family of birth. And I've added many aspects of Celtic spirituality from my Scottish heritage into what I do with Judaism. And I also have added in lots of different aspects of Buddhism and other belief systems into my personal practice. And I also infuse a lot of earth-based conjure work and root work into what I do as well, because that comes from my Southern heritage as a Southern woman in America. And I'm becoming more and more vocal about what I do, how I blend these things together and the different things that I believe. Obviously, I'm pretty vocal with a podcast. I've made my personal spiritual walk into a business and I keep making that more and more known who I am and what I believe in and what I stand for. And so this pretty much what I've said is me in a nutshell. And it amazes me where I've come from. It's my life and I know it, but talking about it, putting it out there just makes it feel amazing to me. Now, my path obviously has not been linear and I haven't reached the end of my path because I'm still alive and so I still have things to do. But the fact that I have walked this, what I call an amazing path and that I'm only partway along this path, that I still have more to come, that's just, I love that. It speaks to me in a way that many things don't. And I fully expect that the rest of my path will be just as amazing as the first part. 